adequate assessment of shoulder problems requires examination of the shoulder itself, as well as other areas which can cause shoulder pain or mimic shoulder pathology. In this videotape, we will review the orthopedic examination of the shoulder. The examination begins with those anatomic areas apart from the shoulder, and then later addresses the shoulder girdle itself. By doing so, we are forced to focus on all possibilities in the differential diagnosis. The examination is comprehensive without being exhausting. Positive findings in a certain part of this exam may lead you to perform other tests not included. The examination is arranged to flow easily from one segment to the next. This creates a sense of repetition which promotes efficiency and minimizes clinical oversight. Before beginning the shoulder examination, it is important to have the proper setup. This includes an exam table, which allows comfortable access to both sides of the patient for comparative examinations. The proper patient attire should allow unrestricted examination of the patient while maintaining modesty. In males, having the shirt off is adequate. In this tape, we will use a female subject and demonstrate a specially designed gown that fulfills these requirements. The complete shoulder evaluation includes the following. Cervical spine exam. Neurovascular exam of the upper extremities. Evaluation for thoracic outlet syndrome. Evaluation of the clavicle and its joints. Inspection and palpation of the shoulder girdle. Range of motion testing, both active and passive. Rotator cuff strength testing. Impingement testing. Biceps test. Instability testing and test for generalized ligamentous laxity. The examination begins with the cervical spine. Starting with the head in the upright position, three ranges of motion should be recorded. Flexion and extension are both described in degrees present. Lateral flexion is described in degrees from a sagittal reference point. Rotation is estimated in degrees from the neutral position. The compression test is a provocative test. Downward pressure is applied with the neck in slight extension. Pain radiated into the patient's arms may indicate cervical pathology. Sperling's test is another provocative test. The neck is stressed in lateral flexion, rotation, and compression. If pain occurs in the ipsilateral extremity, the test is considered positive. The neurovascular exam is a cursory exam which includes the following. Radio pulses, test for thoracic outlet syndrome, and muscle strength testing of both upper extremities. The radio pulse is palpated and compared to the opposite extremity. The vascular exam includes provocative tests to evaluate vascular compression in the thoracic outlet. Keep in mind, the reliability of these tests is low. Absent maneuver and rights maneuver. The classic Atson maneuver is performed with the arm at the side. The neck is hyperextended and rotated toward the ipsilateral side as the patient inspires deeply. Any decrease or obliteration of the radial pulse with concomitant reproduction of the symptoms is considered positive. Wright's test is performed with the arm abducted to 90 degrees and externally rotated. The neck is extended and rotated to the contralateral side as the patient inspires deeply. Again, any decrease or obliteration of the pulse with concomitant reproduction of the symptoms is considered a positive test. A rapid examination of the upper extremity motor strength follows, including the trapezius, deltoids, biceps, triceps, wrist extensors, wrist flexors, finger extensors, finger flexors, and the intrinsic muscles of the hand. The wall push-off test is then performed looking for a scapular wing to evaluate the serratus anterior. If indicated additional tests may be performed to complete the neurovascular exam, including evaluation of sensation and reflexes. Attention is now turned to the shoulder girdle itself. Inspection and palpation begin with the clavicle and its joints. This is begun medially with the sternoclavicular joint and progresses laterally over the body of the clavicle, ending with the acromioclavicular joint. An additional test used to elicit 
symptoms is the forced abduction test. Inspection and palpation continues with the glow humeral and scapular thoracic joints, noting any asymmetry, warmth, or tenderness in these areas. Range of motion is tested both actively and passively. Active elevation is tested in forward flexion and abduction. Active external rotation is tested at both the side and at 90 degrees of abduction. Active internal rotation is measured by the spinal level, achieved by the thumbs behind the back. For viewing the posterior aspect of the patient, evaluate for scapular humeral rhythm as they actively abduct their arms. Passive range of motion is measured with the patient in the supine position, with the shoulder extended over the edge of the examining table. Abduction is tested first with the arm brought up in the coronal plane. Passive external rotation is tested both at the side and at 90 degrees of abduction. The intrinsic muscles of the glenohumeral joint, the rotator cuff, are next evaluated for strength. Resisted external rotation tests the infraspinatus and the caries minor. Resisted internal rotation tests the subscapularis. Resist abduction with the arm held horizontally in the plane of the scapula, with thumbs pointing down to isolate supraspinatus weakness. Impingement syndrome and rotator cuff pathology are common causes of shoulder morbidity in the general population. Impingement pain is assessed with the following provocative signs. Mears impingement sign, Hawkins impingement sign, supraspinatus sign, and the impingement test. Mears impingement sign is produced by forced forward elevation of the primitive arm with the scapula stabilized. Pain elicited in an arc between 70 and 120 degrees is considered positive. Hawkins impingement sign is produced by forward elevation, internal rotation, and adduction. The supraspinatus impingement sign is produced by resistant abduction of the permitted arm in the scapular plane. Pain with or without associated weakness is considered a positive sign. The impingement test requires injection of 10 cc of 1% lidocaine in the subacromial space and repeating the provocative maneuvers. Relief or marked reduction of pain indicates a positive test. The following maneuvers test for pathology of the biceps tendon Jurgensen's test, and Speed's test. In Jurgensen's test, the patient externally rotates the arm, flexes the elbow, and supinates the forearm against resistance. The examiner palpates the bicipital groove and attempts to elicit tenderness or popping in that location. The Speed's test involves resisting forward flexion at 90 degrees, with the forearm supinated and the elbow extended. Again, the examiner palpates the bicipital groove to elicit tenderness or popping. The various tests described for examination of shoulder instability attempt to document abnormal translation between the humeral head and glenoid fossa with passive stress applied. The following tests are performed. The classic apprehension test, passive circumduction, abduction maneuver, test for posterior instability, Cofield's translational stability test, performed in external rotation, both sitting and supine, anterior and posterior drawers tested in the supine position, Job's relocation test, and the sulcus test for inferior and multidirectional instability. The classic apprehension test is performed with the patient sitting. The arm is brought into 90 degrees of abduction and maximal external rotation. The test can be augmented by applying forward and downward pressure to the humeral head. Patients with a history of anterior dislocation or subluxation will experience apprehension with this maneuver. The passive circumduction abduction maneuver test for posterior instability. In the patient with this instability pattern, the humeral head subluxes in the abducted position and relocates with a palpable clunk as the arm is circumducted. Cofield's test for translational stability document the competence of the anterior inferior glenohumeral ligament as it is tightened with increasing degrees of external rotation. The test is performed in both the sitting and supine positions, and the amount of anterior posterior translation is noted.
The anterior drawer test is performed with the patient supine. It is similar to Cofield's test, except the arm is held in 90 degrees of abduction. Anterior posterior translation in the presence of clicks or clunks is noted. The posterior drawer places the arm in 90 degrees of forward flexion. A posteriorly directed force is applied, and the magnitude of displacement is palpated. Joe's relocation maneuver for anterior instability is performed with his patient supine and the arm placed in the apprehension position. Pain or apprehension produced in this position can be relieved by pushing the humeral head posteriorly or relocating it. A positive test includes relief of symptoms and or a relocation event. The inferior sulcus test involves placing general traction on the patient's arm in the sitting or supine position. A subacromial sulcus is associated with inferior or multidirectional instability. It is important to assess generalized ligamentous laxity in any patient with instability problems. Common indicators include elbow recurvatum greater than 10 degrees, thumb to forearm opposition less than 1 centimeter, distal interphalangeal joint hyperextension greater than 30 degrees, and metacarpal phalangeal joint hyperextension greater than 60 degrees. The method we have presented is a comprehensive but efficient assessment of the patient with shoulder complaints. Whatever method you choose to evaluate the shoulder, use the same test in the same sequence in order to develop both proficiency and efficiency in evaluating shoulder problems.